All right, everybody, I'm so excited to have my friend Frank Turek on again on my channel to talk about a topic that we're both very passionate about. Frank just uh, expanded a third edition of his book, Correct, Not Politically Correct. And uh, I had the honor of reading this book, and I'm really glad to have him on to talk about some of the topics that are here. Uh, Frank, thank you so much for coming on today and speaking with me. Yeah, hey, Melissa, great being on with you. And uh, this is such a hard topic for people that uh, I thought... I would write on it. And as you know, from the book, I'm not mm. quoting Bible verses. This is not a book that's written to say that because the Bible says, were you taking a natural law, uh, common sense medical case against transgenderism and same sex marriage, how they're not good for individuals and not good for society as a whole? Mm -hmm. Yes. And you do this in your talks as well. When you do your I don't have enough faith to be atheist uh, conferences, the what I respect and what I really enjoy is that you start with what is truth? Does God exist? Are miracles real? Right? Mm -hmm. Before you even get into anything with religion or the Bible or anything. And I think that is very effective. I think that's really cool. Um, now, okay, this book, I remember you talking about this a while ago, and I didn't realize it was this book, but you mentioned that you got fired back in the day for writing this book. I'm wondering uh, if you could start off by telling us a little bit about that. What happened? Yeah, well, in 2008, I wrote a book called Correct, Not Politically Correct, How Same-Sex Marriage Hurts Everyone. And uh, I didn't write it again from a biblical perspective in the sense that I wasn't quoting Bible verses I just mentioned. I was just making the natural law medical case that same-sex yeah. marriage was not good for individuals or a nation. And at that time, uh, uh, even though cross examine had already started. I was only working part-time at Cross-Examined. I was putting my family, when I went to seminary and we moved to Charlotte way back in 1993, I had to make money. So I started doing corporate training for companies. And for many years, I did corporate training for Cisco and also Bank of America. Cisco, not the food people, but the computer people, CISCO, that mm -hmm. they're out head, headquartered out in San, in, uh, San Jose. Long, long story short, um, back in 2011, I was teaching a leadership class at Cisco and I was fired because uh, someone in the class Googled my name and figured out I had written the book. Now, this is the third edition, but the first edition was similar. And uh, they said, well, Frank can't work here because uh, he doesn't agree with same sex marriage. Now, keep in mind, this was not something I ever brought up at at in my leadership training. Mm -hmm. uh, yet this man who identified as uh, homosexual just figured out that I had written this book and decided that I couldn't work at Cisco. Now, keep in mind, Melissa, this is four years prior to the Supreme Court yeah. imposing same-sex marriage on the nation. Mm -hmm. So uh, at, at that point, the CEO of Cisco was a man by the name of John Chambers. And John Chambers in 2008, uh, during the presidential election, was on the elect McCain Commission in California. He wanted McCain to be the president. And hmm. at, in that election, it was Senator McCain against Senator Obama for the for the presidency. And so, uh, as you know, Senator McCain served in the Navy and so did I. So I, I wrote John Chambers, the CEO of Cisco. I said, uh, thank you for support of Senator McCain in the last election. Uh, I am a, to a United States Navy veteran. Uh, I was uh, fired from your company because I didn't agree with same sex marriage. Uh, are you aware that Senator McCain holds the same position on same-sex marriage that I do? Are you qualified to be working at Cisco? So the next day I got a phone call because I FedExed it to his office and the attorney said, well, what do you want? And I said, well, I don't really want anything except you call the dogs off other Christians. And I was a vendor. I, I wasn't an employee, so they could fire me for any reason. But I just said, look, I, I can't understand. You claim to be inclusive, tolerant, and diverse. How was it that I was excluded and not toler tolerated for holding a diverse view? And the attorney said, well, I could set you up to talk to a lady by the name of Marilyn Nagel. She said she's the head of our inclusion, toler co uh, tolerance, and diversity division, whatever that meant, right? I said, okay, let's set up the meeting. So a couple of weeks later, I'm actually at Summit in Colorado, and my friend Mike Adams was there, and we had this call scheduled Marilyn Nagel. So I asked her, I said, hey, you know, I, I told her what happened. And I said, uh, you claim to be inclusive, tolerant and diverse. How How is it that I, I wasn't tolerated? I was excluded for holding a diverse view. And she couldn't answer the question. And I, I said, what does tolerance mean? What does inclusion mean? What does diversity mean? She couldn't answer any of the questions. 
Hmm. And the, the conversation went so poorly that when it was over, I turned to Mike. I said, we got to go public with this. We've got to tell people the world that the, although these people are claiming to be inclusive, tolerant and diverse, they're, they're not they're not it at all. Inclusion, tolerance and diversity to corporate elites means if you don't see it our way, we're going to hurt you. Mm -hmm. So Mike wrote the first column called the Cisco Kid. And then I wrote a column that it was on townhall.com and a, a, maybe a few other places called Sex at Work. By the way, do not Google Sex at Work. Don't Google that. If you Google that, it'll take you right to Harvey Weinstein's <laughs> website. Okay, no. Go to crossexamine.org and go to our little search bar there and type in Sex at Work. You'll see the article. And basically what I do in there, Melissa, is I ask the question, why is corporate America talking about sex at work? Are we supposed to have sex at work? I mean, what's the point here? As long as we treat everyone with respect, regardless of whether or not we agree on sexual issues, we ought to be able to work together. And so I, I, I said, I pledge to people who might not agree with me on certain religious and moral issues. I pledge that I'm going to treat them with respect because they're made in the image of God. We don't have to agree on everything to work together. When mm -hmm. you really think about this, why is corporate America so obsessed with this? It really doesn't have anything to do with workplace productivity. Do we all have to agree that certain sexual practices are good or bad in order to make widgets or to uh, conduct some sort of service for people? No, we don't. Mm -hmm. In any event, um, after that happened, I couldn't work in corporate America anymore because I was out. <laughs> I was out as a Christian. I was out as somebody who didn't believe in same-sex marriage. So <laughs> Bank of America fired me right after that. And uh, and then in then I went full-time with Cross-Examine. This is uh, what I was 49 years old. And uh, that was in 2011. So since then, I've been doing Cross-Examine full-time. And then in 2016, after the Supreme Court imposed same-sex marriage on the entire nation, actually, they did it in 2015. In 2016, I updated the book. Mm -hmm. And then in just this year, I updated it again because of transgenderism. So now this is the new third edition. Mm -hmm. And we're dealing with all these issues without quoting Bible verses, as, as I mentioned. And I left the first and second sections just as they are because... I think the arguments are still good. And much of what I said there, unfortunately, has come true yeah. with regard to what I said would happen if same-sex marriage is imposed on the nation. Yes. And this is what I found particularly interesting is like, a okay, so my best friend, she brought this up a long time ago, and I never thought about it this way. But there was an issue at that time where people are Christians, not even Christians, just conservatives were concerned from a societal level. And they're like, this is a slippery slope, guys. This is something that's going to uh, evolve into something that th is not good for our nation. And everybody's like, yeah, you're being paranoid. You're being fanatical. Mm -hmm. And the thing with a slippery slope is sometimes you don't know if that's the case until time has gone by to see if that's the case, if that's what happened. And it seems to be wow, that was a really big turning point, same-sex marriage, into the evolution of where we got to where we are today with a lot of the transgender craze, uh, gender spectrums, everything that's, that's happening. And it's very odd um, and interesting to pinpoint it to that. Now, you talk about same-sex marriage, and again, not from a biblical perspective, which some people might kind of like, what, Frank? What, Melissa? <laughs> How could you do that? But I'm here to say that's actually really brilliant because if you're somebody that doesn't believe in God or the Bible, there are still statistics and facts, really good reasons why uh, this view is, you know, held. And I'm wondering if you could do that. So uh, if you can give some help, helpful statistics and, and facts for why anybody would have an issue with same-sex marriage at all, because most people would look at you and I and think, wow, you're just being hateful. You're being mean. You're being harmful to this group of people. Mm -hmm. uh, when really uh, you're looking at this from a very different and very interesting societal perspective, which actually a lot of psychologists and sociologists quietly agree with. Yeah. I, maybe before we get there, let's just point this out. Um, the culture thinks that love requires approval. Mm -hmm. When in reality, if you think about it, love does not require approval. Uh, I ask parents or kids, actually, I ask kids, if your parents approve of everything you wanted to do or approved of everything you wanted to do when you were 13, would they have been loving parents? 
of course, people go, no, no, my parents, if they approved of everything I did, they wouldn't be loving, they'd be unloving. They'd be enabling me to destroy myself and others. Mm -hmm. And because love does not require approval, love requires that you stand in the way of evil that people want to do. You know, in the passage, uh, Melissa, that everyone reads at their wedding, but nobody obeys, 1 Corinthians 13, yeah. Paul yeah. says, love always protects. Yeah. He says, love mm -hmm. does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but love rejoices in the truth. The love truth. always yeah. perseveres, right? Mm -hmm. So in order to love people, you need to protect them, which means you have to stand in the way of the evil that they want to do. And so I think we need to, to say that from the outset, the motivation we ought to have is to love people, but love doesn't mean you approve of everything they do. Mm -hmm. In fact, I'm reminded of this. Uh, when I first wrote this book back in 2008, I got an email from an FBI agent. The guy was undercover with NAMBLA. You know what NAMBLA is? The no. North American Man Boy Love Association. These are the pedophiles. Wow. OK, and um, he had just written a book. I can't remember the name of the book, but he said, I have your book, Correct, Not Politically Correct. And you deal with the objection. We were born this way because that's that was the the justification for saying, well, that's why we should engage in this behavior. And he said to me, do you know what the pedophiles are using as their justification for what they do? We were born this way. Uh, we just have this affinity for children and we can't help it. Now, of course, in the book, I point out there's a difference between attractions and actions. Yes. We all have, we all have attractions we ought not act on. Mm -hmm. And you know, and I know that if we, and everyone watching knows that if you continue, or let me put it this way, if you, without moral restraint, act on every attraction you have, you wouldn't live very long. Mm -hmm. You certainly wouldn't have stable relationships very long because you have attractions all the time that you need to say no to. Mm -hmm. particularly as you and I are both married, not to one another, but we're married, right? We, mm -hmm. we, we have to say no to anybody else that we find attractive. Otherwise, mm -hmm. our relationship is going to be destroyed. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's just a simple example. You, you see things you're attracted to all the time, whether it's from a financial perspective. I wish I could buy that. Yeah, I'm going to go into debt if I do. Or I wish I could eat that. Yeah, I'm going to become you know, 600 pounds if I keep doing that. You know, you always have to say no to attractions. Mm -hmm. Most of the time you have to say no. And unfortunately, the culture, at least in some areas, seems to think that, no, you have to act on your attractions. No, you don't. Mm -hmm. You have to act on what is moral and right. Otherwise, you're going to destroy yourself and others. And if you look at same-sex behavior, just mm -hmm. medically, no one likes to talk about this, but I mm -hmm. talk about it in the book and I have just footnotes throughout it. Same, spec, same sex behavior from a medical perspective is not healthy. Mm -hmm. In fact, and, and stats change because our medical care has improved. But for, say, gay men, their, their lifespan is anywhere between 8 and 20 years uh, less than heterosexuals. Mm -hmm. Just because medically, and not to go into the details here, but, but medically, mm -hmm. as we know, it, 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 and, and anatomically, it doesn't work. It's, 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 it's an abuse of the, of the human body. Mm -hmm. People never say this. They don't want to say it. But look, it's just the truth. Mm -hmm. OK. And so if you get the book correct, not politically correct, I get into all that. And, yeah. And, and you can take it or leave it. But it's the truth. You don't look, you don't like it. I'm sorry. That's just the way it is. Yeah. And then you talk about orientation and behavior. Mm -hmm. And there's a difference between them. Where, yes. yeah, like it's not necessarily the issue isn't the orientation, it's the sexual behavior. Right. And, and uh, I, I think you do a good job of parsing that out. So for people that kind of want to know more about that. Let um, me say one other thing, because sure. the genesis yeah. of this book really came out of a friend of mine who died in 1993 of AIDS. Oh, yeah, and, you mentioned and, that. Yeah, yeah I, start that, I start the book out mm -hmm. with that. And his parents who were my, I mean, the, the kid grew up right next to me. Mm -hmm. his, his, his younger brother was my best friend. He was just a little bit older than me mm -hmm. and uh, his parents were like second parents to me. But when his, when this, this friend of mine came out back in the late eighties, his parents didn't really know what to do. And instead of kind of warning him that this is not the road to go down, they, they embraced his lifestyle and uh, tried to affirm everything he was doing. And six years later he was dead. Mm -hmm. Um, now, look, I, I'm not trying to cast blame on them for that. I'm just pointing out that it probably wasn't the best approach in hindsight to say, yeah, you should do this because you have this attraction. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, 
it's medically not a road you want to go down. Yeah, you know, and see, and I think that that's where that kind of gets lost on people, because mm -hmm. that's why, you know, a conversation like this would be considered hateful for people, you know, in this, in this demographic, but it's, we're not, we don't hate you. Like, mm -hmm. if you're watching this, you know, and thank you for watching, you may not agree with us or even like us. But um, yeah, there, there's a love and a concern that, as you said, a lot of people don't talk about. Uh, that is this good for society as a whole? Is this good for you? Is this good for... And I think that that's where uh, Carl Truman talks about this, where the individual self, you know, the authentic self within is what's taking dominance instead of what's good for everybody, like an mm. unselfish type of, of wholeness. Mm. And it's tough for people to see past that. And from what oh, I... It, oh, yeah, it is. And yeah. When you look at from a political perspective, there's only three things mm -hmm. a government can do on any issue. A government can prohibit, prohibit a behavior, permit a behavior, or promote a behavior. Those are the only three things you can do. Mm -hmm. you, can, you can prohibit, permit, or promote. Now, for many years in, in most of our nation's history, the nation through the states thought it was acceptable to prohibit same-sex behavior. Mm -hmm. And we might today say, well, it's a free country. We should allow people. We should permit people to do that. OK, so you've, now you're moving from prohibit to permit. Mm -hmm. But to go to same sex marriage, what you've done now is you've gone to promote. Now you're saying that the behavior is a good thing. And by the way, even as late as 1986, the Supreme Court said that the states had the right to prohibit same sex behavior. It wasn't until 2003 in the Lawrence v. Texas decision that the Supreme Court said, oh, you can't prohibit it anymore. Now, the Constitution didn't change, right? It was just the Supreme Court had changed and went more political. Now, you, you can argue the political, you know, should, should it pro be prohibited or not? Let's just mm -hmm. say it's a free country. OK, it be, should be permitted. But to go from permit to promote, hmm. now you're doing something else. You're saying this is a good thing. And you know what the real problem with same-sex marriage is? from my view anyway, and as I do, I explain this in the book, correct, not mm -hmm. politically correct. It's not that same-sex marriage is the issue. It's that marriage now as an institution has become genderless. And mm -hmm. if it's become genderless, what that means is that marriage no longer has any connection to children. Because if two men can get married or two women can get married, that's not a procreative relationship. Uh, and you're teaching, the law is a great teacher, you're teaching society that marriage is just about coupling. It's not about children. Well, if there is not, a, if marriage is not the institution to protect children, what institution does protect children? Now, of course, we know that there are some opposite sex marriages that don't produce children, but those are the exception rather than the rule. And secondly, they still uh, exhibit to society a generally procreative relationship. And thirdly, that marriage keeps the man off the street from impregnating women who are not uh, his wife. So that marriage still has advantages to society. But when you look at the purpose of marriage from a societal perspective, mm -hmm. the reason the government's involved in marriage is not to recognize romantic affinity. The reason the government's involved in marriage is to, pr is to uh, procreate or to protect and propagate society, to stabilize mm -hmm. and propagate society. That's the reason the government's involved in marriage. It's not to recognize that John loves Mary or Bill loves Steve or any of those things. I mean, why, mm -hmm. why would the government care about that? Mm -hmm. Really, when you think about it. I mean, when you go, when you were for your marriage license, they didn't ask you, do yeah, you really love him? Uh, did, did they, do you really love her? No, they don't ask you that question. Yeah. Right? They're, they're asking you uh, questions about procreation. You know, do you, does the blood type work here? That kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Because that's why the government's involved in marriage. And it really wasn't the same sex, the LGBTQ community that has given us same sex marriage. Melissa, it's really uh, Christians who bought into the who bought into the romance view of marriage. Mm -hmm. We're the ones that said, well, marriage is just about romance. Well, if it's just about romance, why, why, why not two men or two women? Mm -hmm. that's, that's what brought brought us genderless marriage. It's really, it's really. Yeah. Awesome. And you've been vocal about this too lately where you, and I always, I always like that when people of in, in any group take some sort of responsibility, right? Where they're like, well, Hey guys, we got to look at us and see what we did um, over time to kind of get us where we're at today. And because that's what we would want from people we disagree with too. Right. Sure. Yeah. yeah. So I think that that's healthy insight. So uh, yeah, let's parse that out a little bit more. Because you've been uh, vocal about this where uh, Christians have some responsibility 
in this regard. Uh, what do you mean by that? How, how would you say that there has been an effect? Is it because Christians haven't been involved? They just like, yeah, eh, we don't want to be involved with this. This isn't really our place. Is, is that what it is? Or is there a little bit more on that? Well, the first no-fault divorce law came out of California, signed by Ronald Reagan, hmm. the governor of California. Hmm. Well intended, he thought, you know, people are trapped in bad marriages. We've got to get, get them out of it. The problem is the negative consequence of that is that now people can leave a marriage without, no, no matter whose fault it was, and leave the other person stranded. Hmm. And a lot of times the reason they do that is because they no longer have romantic feelings for the other person. Well, if marriage is all about feelings, never don't take the vow because you can't vow feelings for the next 50 years. You know, you can't vow I'll never be hungry or I'll never be angry. You can't. Mm -hmm. All you can do is vow behavior. And by the way, you don't need a vow when you're all lovey-dovey with your spouse, right? Mm -hmm. You don't need a vow at all. I mean, you're infatuated. You're, you know, you're, you're not going anywhere. You need a vow when you wake up in the morning and you go, you again. <laughs> right? That's when you need the vow. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, Christians have bought into the you again idea of marriage. Oh, you, you're not the one for me anymore. I got to find somebody else who really lights my flame. And so mm -hmm. we bought into no fault divorce that spread across the country. And now people think marriage is just about the romantic affinity of two adults. So mm -hmm. why not two men or two women? It's just that's just where it goes. It's our fault. We're mm -hmm. the ones that brought this on ultimately because we didn't view the covenant view of marriage that I'm with you for better or worse. Mm -hmm. I'm with you because we need to love one another, even if when we don't like one another mm -hmm. and we need to bring up children and we need to stay together, at least for the sake of the children. And we have this covenant together before the state and before God. And of course, from a Christian perspective, this marriage is an illustration of our ultimate union with Jesus. Yeah. Yeah. And I think it's uh, just so everybody knows, it's not like we're advocating for, you know, abusive marriages. Like, you know what I mean? Like, we're not sitting here. Not. And I hope yeah, people, yeah. people don't, people read stuff into what we do, right. do and don't say. But obviously what we're saying is that uh, everything Frank is saying, I agree with that. I think that there's just this, this easy way out on some levels mm -hmm. and it's tough. It is tough sometimes to stick that out. And um, there's good societal reasons for that. Now, there's so much more that you say about this in your book and you give lots of stats and you talk more about same-sex marriage. Let's transition over to something that um, I just have no cant with, which is the transgender craze. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, this has really been a big reason why I started homeschooling my girls. Best decision ever, by the way. It's really good. It's going well. Um, but all right. There are people I know, this is, this is something that I wanted to ask you specifically about, that it's like they just don't believe that this is an issue, right? Maybe they're leftists. Maybe they just look at us like we are nuts. Like we think, they think that we are just hateful and just being mean. Um, they just don't believe that homosexuality and transgenderism, this whole thing, is being forced on people, not through media, mm. not through schools, mm. uh, not through TV. And they're just being represented, all right. That's all they're, that's all we're doing, guys. We're trying to give them representation. You know, they're a minority and they've been through a lot. And we we just want them to be noticed and recognized and respected. Nobody's forcing this down y'all's throats. And I just adamantly disagree. Mm -hmm. And I know that there's people watching that may just be completely oblivious to this. As apologists, though, I think it's really important to understand how and why we got to where we're at and understanding that perspective. Mm -hmm. And I still think it's really odd that people just like, oh, you guys got it wrong. Nobody's forcing this down your throats. And I'm like, okay, well, people are losing jobs if they don't agree with this. Mm -hmm. You know, like there's there's actual consequences. If, you know, like you're in a, a student meeting, you're in a teacher's meeting and they ask your name and pronouns, right? right. I mean, it's strange. It's just, it's under the, it's nobody's forcing it. And this is why what Greg talks about the soft totalitarianism. Sure. It's under the guise of tolerance, love, mm -hmm. and coexist mm -hmm. And what I'm wondering if you could give a response to this perspective. Like, what are your thoughts about this? Well, when somebody says, uh, if you're in a, in a business right now and they're trying to force you to admit or to cite your pronouns, I think you ought to have a meeting with your HR person and say, hey, I, I just have a question about some of our policies. And mm -hmm. I don't want to question anyone's intentions here. I think all intentions here are good. I just think there may be some unintended consequences that people may not have realized by this policy. 
And my first question would be, do you think it is okay to try and force people to violate their consciences hmm. and see what they say? Because if they say yes, they've just probably violated the Civil Rights Act. Um, if they say no, which is the right answer, then you might say, well, please don't ask me to violate mine. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm here at this place to work and to uh, provide anything I can here for the company to succeed. Uh, I pledge that I'm going to treat everybody with respect because they're made in the image of God. Uh, but we don't, that doesn't mean we have to agree on every moral or political issue. If that were the case, no company could come together because not everyone's going to agree on every issue. Mm -hmm. So I would simply ask them that question that do you think you ought to try and, and force somebody to violate their conscience? And if they say yes, they're in big trouble. If they say no, you could say, great, then don't ask me to violate mine. Uh, there's other questions you could ask as well, but that would be where I would go. And of course, mm -hmm. Greg in his book, Tactics, uh, says there's another question you can ask. Do you consider yourself a tolerant person, right, from a, from a, um, a personal perspective? And of course, they're going to have to say yes. And then you can say, great, if I have an, a, an opinion on a controversial issue that is different from yours, you'll tolerate it then, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. So um, I think just asking for tolerance, using their very phrases and their words can help them realize that what they're doing is wrong. That's why I asked the lady at Cisco, you know, mm -hmm. how do you define tolerance? How do you define diversity? How do you define inclusion? And as soon as they begin to define it, they're not going to be able to answer the question without contradicting themselves, mm -hmm. because that's what this is. Now, if people don't think this is forced upon you, you're you haven't realized what's going on at the federal level or in the state of California. Mm -hmm. At the federal le level, on March 31st, and I document this in the book, Correct, Not Politically Correct, March 31st, 2022, President Biden came out on Trans Visibility Day uh, and talked about how trans people are brave and how they're made in the image of God. Of course, they're made in the image of God. Yeah. What he left out was the second part of the verse, that he made them male and female. Uh, and then his HHS department, put out a memo that basically said that if you're a parent and your child identifies uh, as another gender and you do not affirm them with what is now called gender affirming care, a nice sounding <laughs> phrase, um, the government may come and take that child from you. And, you know, in California, they just I think they just passed a bill that said that. Yeah. That the government can come into your home if your three year old girl thinks she's a boy and you don't affirm that. They're going to come and take that child from you, potentially. This is madness, Melissa. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I don't care if you're a Christian or not. If you don't stand against that, um, you're, you don't know how to stand against evil. I mean, that's evil to have a government come into your house and take your child away from you and then potentially give your child puberty blockers, cross-sex hormones, and maybe even surgery. Mm -hmm. Something, by the way, that's impossible, as I talk about in the book. You can change your mind. You can't change your, your gender. Yes. You can't change your sex. It's yeah. impossible. It's in every one of your 100 trillion cells. You mm -hmm. can change your mind, but you can't change your biology. And yet that's what this entire movement is trying to do, change your biology. And the research shows that people that actually go through with the surgery, 10 years after the surgery, have a suicide rate 19 times higher than the general public. Which this is very really interesting. Yeah. yeah. This is after the surgery. They have a honeymoon period where they feel better. Mm -hmm. But then later on, at the 10 year mark, all proverbial hell breaks loose. And tragically, the suicide rate is 19 times higher than the general public. Why? Because we've tried to treat a mental condition with surgery. You mm -hmm. can't do that mm -hmm. in most cases. You don't treat mental delusions with surgery, you treat it with psychiatry, with with a cognitive therapy, with counseling, with prayer. You don't treat it with surgery. And yet that's the, the, the road the medical community wants to take. Why? Cha-ching. You can see how much money is involved here. Mm -hmm. By the way, as we point out in the book, nobody ever completely transitions. They mm -hmm. have to get a lifetime of hormones to try and artificially force their body to go in a direction the body is not meant to go. So this goes on and on and on. It, mm -hmm. it, it's, it's a boon to the medical community because they make all sorts of money. But to the people that actually go through it, it actually doesn't solve the problem. You can believe whatever you want, but mm -hmm. you can't change what's true. 
That's right. Yeah. And that's what they're trying to do is through this whole intolerance and inclusion and diversity uh, language by saying, hey, you know, you're, this is inclusive language. This is diverse mm -hmm. language. Use this language. And without really realizing it, you've, you, you've agreed to and undergirded this sort of movement. And I think that's one reason and one way that they, they've kind of gotten into that. And another thing you talk about is uh, the government coming for our children. You've talked about this a little bit before. Mm -hmm. And uh, you just kind of flat out come out and say, yeah, the government says they're coming for your kids. I'm wondering if you could talk more about that. Because you and I, before we got on, and this is um, um, one thing I really wanted to pick your, your mind about, and I waited mm -hmm. till we're online to talk about mm -hmm. it, but uh, you watched, what, what is the name of the, the movie? I haven't seen it yet. I just heard the interview the that interview. Jordan, That's right. Jordan Peterson it? had with Tim Ballard and Jim Caviezel. There's a new movie called Sound of Freedom Yes. that just came out July 4th. Believe it or not, this small movie put out by Angel Studios, the same people that put out The Chosen. Mm -hmm. The movie, despite the fact being in 2,000 fewer theaters, grossed more than the Indiana Jones movie the first mm -hmm. day it came out. Yes. Because Jim Caviezel plays this guy, Tim Ballard. Tim Ballard was with the Department of Homeland Security and uh, for a while was going out and trying to rescue kids who had been kidnapped into the sex, uh, the sex industry, the, 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 the trading, the sex trafficking of children. And he ultimately gave up his, his government job to do this privately and uh, started Underground Railroad, I think it is, in any event. Uh, this uh, this podcast you have to listen to. It's the Jordan Peterson podcast. I'll and leave a link in the description. Yeah, you can't unhear it. That's the problem. Once you hear it, the kind of horrific things that are going on with regard to uh, sex trafficking. And uh, Tim in this podcast talks about one of the problems that we're experiencing in America. First of all, there's a big demand, believe it or not, for pedophilia in America. Uh, but one of the big problems is the erosion of the moral codes that mm -hmm. uh, have made their way into the schools. We're now we're, we're now teaching kids they can be any gender they want. Um, we're, we're, we're telling kids they can transition. All this feeds right into the sex trafficking industry. And um, so does pornography, quite obviously. Mm -hmm. And Tim makes the connection in this podcast, so I'll leave the remaining comments for him. He mm -hmm. is, he's a modern-day hero when you read about what he's done. He gave up his government job, had six kids of his own, to try and save a whole bunch of kids who were being trafficked. Mm -hmm. And uh, now he runs this ministry to continue to do that. Mm -hmm. uh, but here's, here's one of the problems, and we know this scripturally, mm -hmm. that sexual sin in particular lead you into more and more uh, horrific kinds of behavior. Not always. Let me just put it this way. Not everybody who gets involved in sexual immorality obviously becomes a pedophile. But mm -hmm. the people that do become pedophiles, they start small. They start with um, just normal pornography. And they start going down a road to where, as Paul talks about it in Romans chapter 1, if you suppress the truth long enough about God and start getting involved in sexual immorality, mm -hmm. he's going to give you up to a futile mind to the point where you're not only doing evil, you're cheering on other people who are doing evil. And so the people that do become pedophiles progressively go down, or let's say regressively, <laughs> go down a road from pornography to child pornography to actually being engaged in the kind of behavior I don't even want to talk about. Yeah. And when you listen to this podcast, as I say, you you cannot hear it, some of the things that are going on. Mm -hmm. And uh, for us to just wink at this and go, oh, this is no big deal. Let's just keep moving the sexual lines. You know what's coming next for uh, approval in our country? We've gone from, uh, I mean, you can go way back to, okay, now uh, premarital sex is fine. Now homosexuality is fine. Now, transgenderism is fine. What do you think is coming next? Pedophilia. I don't want to think about it. <laughs> yeah. Now the pedophiles are, are calling okay. themselves minor attracted persons, right? Mm -hmm. They have to make it sound good rather than what it is. And uh, so 
now when the government's involved mm -hmm. to try and say this is a good thing, not the pedophilia, but the transgenderism and that we need to, I mean, look, Melissa, it's so hard to even talk about this stuff. Yeah, but it is. When, you, when you have atheists like Bill Maher, like Richard Dawkins coming out and saying, like Richard Dawkins come out and said, I'm sorry, there's only two genders. It's science. Um, yeah. Bill Maher brilliantly in a, in a, a show he did back in May of 2022 called Along for the Pride, mm -hmm. pointed out how this whole transgender craze is social media driven. And uh, he said, look, kids go through phases. Uh, he, he said, if everyone knew what they wanted to be when they were eight, the world would be filled with princesses and cowboys, exactly. yeah, but I it's not. That. And he said, when I was a kid, I wanted to be a pirate. Thank God nobody took me seriously and took me for eye removal and peg leg surgery, right? Yeah. I mean, he, he, he can see the problem. And mm -hmm. tragically, most American pastors are silent on the issue. Mm -hmm. How can you be silent on this stuff? When kids are, are being mutilated, when, when, when this feeds the whole sex trafficking industry, how can you be silent on this? Mm -hmm. Oh, we don't want to get political. Newsflash, the whole, everything's political now. And it's not mm -hmm. because Christians made it political. Do you know in Canada, the Bible's political now? That you can't preach certain Bible verses. Oh, when they come for the Bible pastors, are you going to stand up? Or are you going to say, mm -hmm. oh, no, that's political now. We can't talk about that either. Yeah. I mean, Richard Dawkins, Bill Maher, Douglas Murray, Dave Rubin, these, these guys, Murray and, and Rubin identify as gay themselves, and they're coming out against this. Mm -hmm. I mean, I was just on Dave's show uh, just a week or two ago, mm -hmm. and uh, I have more respect for him than some American pastors who are silent. What, what are you doing? You're, you're not talking about this? I mean, you, 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 know, you know it from a biblical perspective that mm -hmm. you're going you're gonna to be able to save people from... Uh, by warning them about this, you can know from a philosophical perspective, this thing is contradictory. In fact, let me just give you a couple of points on this. Mm -hmm. The people who are for transgender ideology are, contradict themselves because on one hand, they say there are no fixed genders that, you know, you can just, you can, there's a, there's a blend. You can just do whatever you want. Right. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, they unwittingly presuppose there are fixed genders. Yeah. Yeah. Because look, if I'm a man and I think I'm a woman, I have to have some idea what a man is and some idea what a woman is to know I have mm -hmm. this mismatch between my psychology and my biology. Also, if I want to make the so-called transition, which of course is impossible, as we mentioned, you can't change your hundred trillion cells. But if I want mm -hmm. to try, I have to have some idea what a man is and some idea what a woman is mm -hmm. in order to make the transition. So on one hand, they're saying, oh, there are no fixed genders. On the other hand, they have to presuppose fixed genders for transgender, for transgenderism to even be possible. Mm -hmm. Secondly, nature itself shows there's only two genders. Look, all mammals can produce only one of two things, either a sperm or an egg. There's no third category. You can't produce a third thing. Mm -hmm. And if you can't produce either, that's an incapacity. That's not a third capacity. So there are only two genders. And yet people are trying to say there are multiple genders. On one hand, they're trying to say that. On the other hand, transgenderism wouldn't be possible uh, if there weren't fixed genders. Mm -hmm. So it's internally contradictory. And as you know, people who consider themselves LGBTQ have are at a bit of they're, they're in a bit of a civil war because if the T's get their way, Melissa, that there are yeah. no fixed genders, the L's, the G's and the B's don't exist. Look, how yeah. can you be lesbian, gay or bisexual if there are no fixed genders? Exactly. Those genders presuppose. So does mm -hmm. heterosexuality presuppose fixed mm -hmm. genders. And the feminists aren't happy either, because yeah. if there are no genders, there are no women. If there are no women, there are no women's rights. This is why yeah. J.K. Rowling, yeah. who is probably generally liberal politically, has come mm -hmm. out and said, I'm sorry, you're erasing women by this mm -hmm. whole transgender movement. And mm -hmm. she's right. Mm -hmm. So she, she has more courage than many American pastors. Tragic. Yeah. No, it's really interesting that you, you kind of call that out, them out on that, because I think there's there's an element of... You know, and I've kind of been researching this myself, but, you know, like the, this model a lot of churches mm. have mm. has a lot to do with melt needs, not yeah. necessarily preaching theology and the gospel because the offense that it brings, you got to keep that at a minimum. And so I think that's part of it is that the culture, like the American gospel culture, so to speak, I think is part of it. 
Uh, but no, you're, you're spot on. I think that uh, it's really interesting because, you know, the algorithm on YouTube, people might complain about it. I, I like it. <laughs> um, it puts videos like this in front of people's eyes that might be interested in it. But everything you just said about, you know, the like there are lesbians that are angry. There are gay men that are angry, you know, about this, uh, the ideology that's coming along and they're getting lumped in it. And there's these YouTubers that come up in my algorithm that said exactly what you just said, uh, mm -hmm. that they are in agreement with us, that they're like, do we just not exist? You know, um, and it's really interesting to, to hear their perspective on that, that there is a civil war going on and they're upset about what goes on at pride parades. And they're like, why are we bringing kids into this? You know, like we never wanted this. This was not the intent. And all of a sudden, it's just everybody's going after the children, trying to, I want to say it's a strong word, but indoctrinate them with this ideology. It's not just about accepting uh, who these people are. It's an ideology that comes along with it. Well, so, but know, yeah, there's, there's so much that we could talk about and mm -hmm. say, and I'm going to leave that link in the description for everybody mm -hmm. to check out. Um, I actually haven't watched it yet, and I just heard about it because of Frank. So probably after this, I will take a look, um, go hide in a closet somewhere and cry while I watch it. Mm -hmm. And um, Apparently know. the movie is powerful too, and I haven't yeah. seen it myself, Melissa, but uh, I think it's called Sound of Freedom. Yes, uh, and I, I struggle with movies like that because mm -hmm. it's true, and you know, you it's... It's kind of like, I think Greg does this, right? Where he shows this abortion video and I think he purposely looks away um, because he doesn't want to desensitize himself from it. You mm -hmm. know, he doesn't want to get to a point where that doesn't bother him. And I'm exceedingly bothered by child trafficking. Uh, mm -hmm. I have two girls myself and there's there's a reality there that I have to see, you know, to, to know how to protect them and protect my family. You know, so, but yeah, I'll leave that in the description. Check it out, guys. And uh, Frank's book, I will also leave a, a link in the description for you guys to check out. Every We just scratched the surface, you guys. There's so much yeah. uh, that we could have talked about um, in his book. It was a good read. It's very statistics uh, heavy as far as this stuff goes. Yeah, I do want to say that Amazon has been uh, sold out for about a week or so. Uh, we oh, do yeah. have the book. Yeah. Uh, at crossexamine.org. So if you go to crossexamine.org and click on store, you'll see it there. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, it's the third edition. It's selling really well because so many people don't know how to answer the transgender issue. And that's what I try and do. Even if you're not a Christian, uh, I try and show that, uh, as I say, from a natural law medical perspective, yeah. if you care about people, you're not going to lead them down a road that uh, is not going to work you're going to try and have them try and fix their their gender dysphoria through a proper counseling because you can change your mind you can't change your biology mm -hmm. that's the proper way of dealing with a uh, a mental issue and as we point out in the book so much of this goes back to childhood trauma we don't have time yeah. to get into it now but in the book we talk about uh, how many people have decided that they have gender dysphoria and they can trace it back to a child trauma. You know, and you know what else it reminds me of? I was uh, talking to a friend the other day uh, mm -hmm. who she's, she works in law enforcement and she's, I forget the fancy name for her job, but she works with like victims, like a victim unit. She mm -hmm. advocates for them and she sees a lot of stuff. And it reminds me of the cool mom syndrome, right? Mm -hmm. Where, hey, you're a runaway. You come to my house. I'll take you in. I'm loving. I, I will accept you the way you are. And true story, like these houses, there's houses in my area that are like that, where if, you, if you're doing drugs, if you are running away from your home, whatever it is that you are doing, that's the cool house to go to. That's the hangout place. And the mom there, or the dad there, or whatever, is doors wide open and they let you do whatever they want. Do whatever you want here in my home. You are safe here. And horrible things happen in, in these homes. Really bad things because there are no boundaries. There's only affirmation. Mm. And uh, there's just been really bad things that have happened. And that's exactly what it reminds me of, is that people are trying to affirm, come, come to me, come to my home. You can be who you are and what you are. When in reality, the true reality of it is, is that the boundaries are important. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And, and calling that stuff out in love and saying, no, like there's better for you. There's a better life. There's a better way. 
for you. And I don't think anybody wants to be that person. They want to be the cool mom. And so yeah. it reminded me of that while you were talking. And yeah, it's, uh, it's, I, I thought it, of her a few times. It's like if a fish jumps out of your uh, fish bowl, uh, he's outside of the boundaries that allow him to flourish. Yeah. You're not going to say to the fish, hey, you can stay outside the fish bowl. Mm-hmm. Uh, whatever you want to do is fine. No, if you really love that fish, you're going to put him back in an environment where he can flourish. Mm -hmm. And that requires certain boundaries. Mm -hmm. And uh, people don't want boundaries, but boundaries are life. If you don't have boundaries, you're going to destroy yourself and others pretty yeah. quickly. Yeah. So, Frank, thank you so much for talking, uh, coming on to talk about this very Thanks, tough Melissa. topic. It is. I hope you guys yeah. will check out the description. Yeah, find out mm -hmm. more. Um, and yeah, thanks for coming on. All right. Thanks, Melissa. See you soon.